This presentation was first given back in February 2014 to a range of different people, the manufacturers of the Tweed Fish Counters, Vaki from Iceland, uh, members of ACE and other interested parties that were uh, wanted to know more about fish counters and how we use the data. So the presentation is about how we use the data for fish counters but also some background about the fish counters that we have installed, uh, any lessons learned and how we go about processing the data. Fish counters of course are an essential cornerstone of understanding a river and the numbers of fish that, that come up the river to spawn um, because of the because of rod catches and the factors that can influence rod catches fish counters provide the objective data that so the Tweed has three fish counters one of which is out of operation uh, on the Ettrick at the moment but nevertheless we have a long-term data set for that but really these fish counters are located where we can install those counters which is in fish passes uh, that's where the VACI systems seem to work well they, they are most suitable uh, in the end it's provided a broad geographical uh, coverage of fish counters from uh, near the coast on the Wittadder and Alstroms and then uh, moving up the catchment the Gala uh, which is a smaller tributary and then the the Ettrick catchment here uh, which is the largest of the three catchments and has the spring salmon population so it's very good if you can have your fish counters monitor different stocks in different parts of your catchments certainly three is the upper limit in terms of the practicality of, uh, of maintenance and data pro. So here's the the VACI infrared system. Uh, I think it's quite widely known how it works. Two rows of infrared beams. The fish will go put through the the scanner, and the beam, beams are broken, and what will be created is a silhouette um, based on the speed of the fish. And depending on which beams are broken, the direction of the fish um, can also be predicted. This is the Ettrick Pass here and it just shows a typical installation that you require the gap to put your uh, scanner in. This was back in 1998 when the scanner system um, was the only part component of um, the VACI infrared system and since then uh, we have the light tunnel now which I think most people will install um, to allow you to, to record videos so fish are controlled in where they sit and then the camera will take a video clip of the fish which is essential for species identification which we're going to hear a lot more. So here's the Ettrick counter this was probably six or seven years ago before it deteriorated and the old fish pass is situated out here a lot's changed now and we've got a Lorinier fish pass which we'll hear about but nevertheless the Ettrick counter uh, was the most logical place to have a fish counter first of all because of the spring salmon run that is known to to go up the Ettrick and, and Yarrow and that's been shown from radio tracking. So the first practicality of all fish counters is that salmon and trout uh, certainly on the Tweed overlap in, in lengths and therefore you can't just identify or proportion your count according to length you have to have your be your fish. So if we look at the next clip now we can see a typical run of fish this is in black and white in the old system and we can see the forked tails of the fish for salmon and flat tails now for trout and we can see that within there there's a mixture of brown trout and sea trout so there we are there's a the flat tail of the brown trout seven or eight thousand fish that have to do each year to process this data so that the, the processing aspect of fish counter should not be underestimated and there's a probably a 15 pound sea trout going through which, which shows that the Tweed has these these large sea trout runs as well. So here's the results for the Ettrick counter uh, in 2009 after that in the end we, we just had to give up due to the de deterioration of cooled and, and issues with uh, the fish counters and, uh, itself with breaking down but we have quite a reasonable data series there um, going back to 1998 uh, and we can see the fluctuations in numbers from 2700 odd I think there was a couple of months where it was out of operation up to 5,000 fish we can also see the numbers of trout that, that ascend the Ettrick and this stable number here for reasons we're not quite sure about but the numbers are certainly very stable there 
about two and a half thousand and what we want to see or understand is the context to these numbers not just the trends of going up or down but whether these numbers are the right sort of numbers that we should be getting to spawn the next generation of fish and that's what we'll be hearing about more with the gala count so this is the the problem we have with the current um, fish pass on the Etric that we have a, a much larger fish pass with more water but we don't have a kept fish counting solution for a 1.8 meter width Lorinier fish pass so that is currently outstanding at the moment you can see we put the metal staunchions in there to create some flexible system for attaching uh, a fish counter installation in the future but really we're just waiting to see how things pan out uh, how, how this area performs in higher water first the latest fish counter that was installed back in 2009, I think it was, uh, is the Wittadder counter situated at Alstrom's uh, Churnside and they kindly funded the installation of this fish counter in the cooled here. And this is quite different in that fish can actually ascend over the cooled face here and although these baffles are deteriorated a bit they can get up the edges of these baffles so it's not 100% count. But nevertheless, it provides us with plenty of information about run timings of fish uh, and sizes and responses to rises in water, in particular the freshets from Wittada Reservoir. We can see this insulation has a protective frame around it, and that was absolutely vital from a large flood event. So we can see the flood event that we had back in 2012. Uh, still not full height here typically on the east coast we we don't have that much rainfall but then when we do have large flood events they really are quite large and what happened was that boulders were coming down the river and actually hitting the fish pass and then moving laterally sideways into the fish counter and the multiplexer which splits up all the cables was damaged so all fish counters unfortunately require maintenance uh, and it's an important consideration when installing your counter that you have the ability to um, keep an eye on it, maintain it and if required have the funds to send it off to be prepared. So this is the the Wittada video which is really quite different to uh, the, the Etric which is seen in colour and to start with we're just looking at the sea trout that run through a uh, very defined size of 40-50 centimetres silvery fish uh, that will come up uh, Generally June, July, August we'll see them coming through. You can also see the large amount of turbulence here and we'll come back to that. There's the fork tail of some salmon now, fresh springers that have gone through. But this was um, just part of the issue of installing at the top of the, the Denel fish pass and we didn't know how it would react to um, the depth of water and what we've ended up with is this turbulence here but we don't believe that it affects the fish counter operation in any way. So here's the totals for the Wittada counter and we we did have issues in 2011-2012 with the functioning of the, the scanners and it, they were randomly disconnected and we've solved that problem uh, to a Windows problem. So 2013 was really the first year that we've had uh, a complete count and what's very interesting is that we had a very dry summer and so a lot of the fish were delayed, particularly the salmon and they mostly went through in October and this may have all influenced the, the numbers going through the fish pass because certainly through the summer all of the fish would have had to have gone through the fish pass and it was very interesting to note that the sea trout were passing through as many as 50 to 80 fish a day even in the very lowest of water and we really need to analyse that a lot more in a lot more detail but in a few years time we'll start to have a baseline of data that will look something like the system. So the Gala water is what the one that we're really going to look at in a lot more detail situated in Gala Shields it was installed back in 2006 uh, like many other fish counters it took a few years really to get the, the installation right in terms of positioning in a fish, fish pass but it's one of our medium small sized tributaries certainly large enough to support a, uh, a reasonable population of salmon uh, but obviously there's a lot of sea trout that go up as well so the thing is species identification and 
this is uh, pre this is video that I showed to the Gallat Angling Club to show that there are actually brown trout in the in the Tweed system. And this was the very best video clips that you get. And uh, this was in September in low water when the fish would just choose to come up um, without any rise in water. And we can see now that there's a mixture of sea trout as well by those flat tails. And then we can see the very large brown trout that go up the gala water, seven, eight pound brown trout. And then a smaller sized sea trout, 60 to 70 centimeters. And then the fork tail of salmon, skinny grills, even the odd rainbow trout. And then of course the otter, which goes up and down the fish pass every day and will actually predate quite a few of the salmon that are going and sea trout that are going. The fish pass. So, reduced water visibility, this just shows you what it's typically like. Um, as soon as water rises in the gala, you have um, problems with species identification. So, just one of the things we can do is brighten up the image. So, this is the same fish, and we can just make out that that is a salmon. In this system, we can actually identify typically 50 to 77% of fish that go through. But what you'll notice in 2013 is the identification rate dropped down to 17%. And this was because most of the fish went through in a three-day period, four-day period in October, which was the first spate of autumn, and all the fish went through, and we didn't really identify very many fish. So really just to get down to the, the, the finer aspects of fish counters and dealing with the data, there's two ways that we can deal with these unidentified fish. What constitutes the other 83% of these fish, say, in 2000? Well, the first method we can do is just to look at the proportions um, of identified fish for each length in each month. So 70% of salmon, say, in October, at this length will be salmon and 30% will be trout and then if we get any other fish that can't be identified for that length then we'll produce we'll we'll multiply against these proportions to produce numbers that we add to the total for each species that system works very well when you've got plenty of fish in your length category for that month but doesn't work very well when there aren't many fish or no fish at all the alternative method um, which certainly is helpful for 2013, we haven't updated it here, is that you create an average proportion for each length class for each month. So, for example here, uh, 55 to 59, we can take these values here, which really aren't that variable, we can look at the, the minimum and maximum and create a median value for what we think the proportion of salmon should be. Um, so I'm not sure what month this is, but it's saying that 0.37, 37% are salmon in this month and then we can apply those to the unidentified totals particularly for a year like 2013. And when we do this we can compare the two methods and what we find is that the differences are actually very very small or really no more than 150 doing those two methods so that's quite reassuring but which method we actually use I'm not quite sure. Um, probably in terms of practicality the second method uh, the average method is easier. So we've got our totals now and then we need to consider the different aspects of how we use the data and this relates to um, how many fish that we think that we need to spawn the next generation of fish, how many adult fish, salmon in particular, do we need to maximize the production um, of juvenile fish uh, in the next generation. So to, to build up that um, estimate, we need to look at a number of different things, uh, one of which is the number of eggs that the fish are carrying, the length fecundity relationship. Um, we can consider uh, the proportions of salmon, uh, multi-sea winter fish and grills. And then we can consider the stream bed area upstream and other spawning deposition estimates from other studies and how 
the eggs are estimated for the gala um, through the fish counter compared to that. So here's just an illustra um, illustrative picture of um, what the differences are. Uh, even just for a difference of eight centimeters, you can see the difference of 6,000 eggs in a fish. So totals and numbers really are fairly meaningless. You could have uh, lots of small fish, um, which could be the same as quite a few smaller big fish. So really you have to define your leg length egg relationship and then consider the number of eggs that are being deposited upstream of the counter each year. So we've done that for two years. We've done it for 2011 and 2012, taken from uh, smokeries on the Tweed uh, for fish killed in October and November to be as representative as possible. And really the, one of the questions is whether we can define the relationship, um, how much variability there is in it, how does it compare to other rivers and is there variation from year to year? The intercept but also the slopes of the two different graphs and we're going to continue doing this each um, year for, for the foreseeable future. When we look at the next graph we can just compare the lines from other rivers. Um, so here's the line for the two sea winter fish in 2011 and this was the uh, Pope at all, this was um, rivers up north um, I think this was the around the Conan, um, around that area, and they really had a low relationship. Whether there was an uh, an issue with the way they counted their, their eggs, I don't know. Um, this this is the North-esque relationship here, roughly, and it just shows that between the two, you've certainly got double the number um, to the Pope equation. And we were using the Pope equation for um, quite a long time, and it just illustrates the dangers of using a relationship from another river. So we've got our length egg relationships, even though they vary from year to year, and that has implications for how we use it for the fish counter. But how does this pan out with salmon to see winter fish? So we have this system called Salwood, which is a model which can predict from a length and a time of year what uh, type of fish uh, the fish should be. Should it be a grills, one sea winter fish, or a multi sea winter fish? And while this hasn't, this system hasn't been tested, it certainly um, illustrates how the model could work. And I think there's a few issues um, with this, whether this model works with more recent data, whether there's been a breakdown in the relationship between length and the ability to predict. But anyway, we can use this, these proportions here um, provided by the model to predict whether it's a grills or a salmon. So, for example, if you've got a small fish in June, July, August, September, um, below. 50 centimeters here, 45 centimeters, it's going to be a grills. On uh, the other end of the spectrum, if you've got a large fish over 85 centimeters, then it's going to be a multi sea winter fish, and there's overlap here in this area, and it will change through the season as the grills get larger. So, if we run through just a simple model, we've got the totals here for the variation in numbers. It's interesting to note that we had the two lowest totals here in 2012 and 2013 and we think this is related to a snowmelt event in 2010 which wiped out a lot of the fry which um, was shown up in electrofishing. But as mentioned these numbers really what do they mean in terms of the lengths and number of eggs that are deposited. So if we apply um, the equation the relationship with of, length to eggs. This is still using the Pope at all um, relationship. We haven't updated it yet but nevertheless from the lengths of the fish that have gone through we can calculate the number of eggs. So again as expected these are the lowest number of eggs. We can split the eggs up into eggs uh, for grills and eggs from multi sea winter finish and the ratio of the two of grills and multi sea winter fish and we can see that most fish are grills that go up the gala. But we can see that number declines in 2011 to its lowest number there uh, and the highest proportion of multi sea winter fish, which corresponded with um, the higher fecundity relationship in 2011. When that corresponds to egg deposition, we see then for the only year where egg deposition of multi larger multi sea winter fish is more in 2011. In every other year, there's um, normally quite a bit m uh, larger number of grills eggs to multi sea winter fish. So it's very interesting to show that, and maybe there'll be a switch in the future.
who knows, and whether there's any genetic effect of more multi-sea winter fish eggs, who knows. And we can just show those proportions there, so 0 0.53 0 0.47. Normally there's a much larger difference of about 0.3 between these years. So the next thing that we can do then is to compare the egg deposition estimates, the number of eggs we believe upstream to the, the published literature. So what we have to do is cal calculate the stream bed area upstream of the Gala counter. And what you can see here are all the areas obscured by trees because we have the aerial imagery but we can't actually see the stream bed. So we, we have to define the stream bed areas and then estimate the stream bed sections here using average widths from areas upstream of that. But certainly this is the most accurate method. There are other uh, data sets out there, master map, etc., which have been shown to be inaccurate for this method. And then we can go to the literature and look at the egg deposition estimates. Uh, they range from ICs, um, extremely low here, 240, which really I don't think is very representative. Generally, I think we believe that the around the six or seven hundred mark is is far more reasonable for a system like the Gala Water that's um, really reasonably productive. Perhaps the most similar place is the North Esk, and we've got um, a value of 681 from the North Esk. So then we can, can compare our values to the Esk. So we calculated an area of 364,501 square meters upstream of the Gala and then that can be calculated as the number of eggs that have gone in at those different um, spawning estimates. So these are the ones that we're most interested in for the North S 500 um, I think or we round it up to 700. So when we put this into a table these are the actual egg deposition estimates using the length fecundity relationship for Pope and Mills and then we can see how this compares to the values for 500 and 700 up here. So we can see at an egg difference um, the difference in egg numbers amounts to only several hundred thousand in 2012-2013 where we had the lower numbers of return but in some years that can equate to uh, several million eggs. When we look at the 700, per, 700 meters squared estimate um, from around the ESC mark we can see that following this model there would actually be a shortfall in 2012-2013 but that amounts to about 100 fish or so give or take um, with 5,000 eggs per female so that's not an enormous number of fish and what we have to remember is that we're using the Pope and Mills um, graph which was po possibly half or a third less than the, the recent equations that we defined. So this model needs to be updated and I think we can be fairly certain that in both scenarios there's going to be an excess number of salmon in each year. So that's how the basic model has been defined. It's not complex um, at all but based on the the fish counter data improving the spawning um, the, the, the length fecundity relationships uh, we can then build on that to, to create more sophisticated in the future. So just some small things really just with the fish counters um, we need to deal with down fish in a better way because the counter doesn't deal very well with the, the, the way that fish move through the scanner on the way back down they actually move down at an angle and that affects the length of the fish. We struggle sometimes with turbidity like in 2013 so I think that we need to run a trap um, that directly catches fish that go through the counter uh, at that time of year when, when there's high turbidity. There's an issue with the length fecundity relationship in, in the sense that numbers vary um, each year it would appear but we'll see what, what, um, what relationship there is for 2013, 2014 and into the future and whether we have to, to change it every year. And as mentioned we want to look at uh, improving the model using habitat. So that's the Tweed fish counters uh, in a nutshell. I think the Tweed has the most numbers, uh, the highest number of, of VACI infrared um, counters for any person or organisation in Scotland or in the UK. Um, 
and I hope this presentation has been used to those who are considering or using a fish counter at present. Thank you.